I sort of that dream of years you might be thinking, you know, why are there so many issues with this bill? Um, and if you don't know, you can probably be asking the same question. And that is due to the fact that the last um, public referendum was actually 13 years ago. So the government thought that, you know, we, we did that with that consultation 13 years ago. No need to do it again for this release this bill. And hence why we're hearing all these problems tonight. So um, you might be thinking what you can do about this. Uh, we've just actually come through um, another public consultation period for a very important issue in Perth, the Perth Bill Strategic Plan, which some of you may be very aware of. Um, so we're going to have peers come and speak very soon. I'm sure all of you do know him. He's the Director of the Conservation Council. He'll be speaking um, directly in regards to um, our wildlife, why it's in crisis, um, touching on that Perth Bill Plan, which the consultation has just finished for. Um, and so, yeah, from here, we'll be really hearing from here, so we'll have a Q&A. Um, you may be overwhelmed with a uh, lot of um, um, anger and why this has all happened, but at the end, we'll make it really clear on what you can do to take away with you and how we can actually build a movement to ensure that this um, biodiversity does get protected in WA. So that for the group, please. Thanks, Janet. Can people hear me without a microphone? <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Right. <laughs> isn't there? Um, can I acknowledge the Honourable Lynn McLaren, um, MLC for the Greens, and also uh, Uncle Ben Taylor? We could just as easily be having the same conversation about the lack of protection for Aboriginal heritage. In fact, there's an Aboriginal Heritage Amendment Bill uh, before the Parliament which assists the government to delist, i.e. remove protection, from hundreds of Aboriginal heritage sites across the state, including the Burrup Peninsula. Uh, you know, one of the world's iconic rock art uh, sites and the, the first uh, known depiction of the human face in the Burrup Peninsula has been delisted as a site for Aboriginal uh, heritage protection. So it's not just environmental uh, uh, heritage that we're looking to protect. It's also Aboriginal heritage and a very, very similar thing is happening uh, with that legislation before Parliament. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge that and put that on record because it's the same industries, the same processes that are influencing uh, that legislation. So uh, I think you're getting the picture about our environmental legislation and our biodiversity legislation here in Western Australia. We've really got a regime of protecting the environment by exemption. Uh, the environment is protected, our biodiversity is protected, unless the activity that has an impact on the environment uh, is a major industry that uh, exists in Western Australia and has an inevitable impact on the environment and then you're exempt. The fishing industry, exempt from the new biodiversity legislation. The logging industry, exempt from the biodiversity legislation. The mining industry, state agreement acts, mining legislation, largely exempt from the biodiversity uh, conservation legislation. So that's the regime that we have here in place in Western Australia, and uh, the environment is paying the price for that. Um, why have I got a picture of a 1950 F.J. Holden? Well, the current Wildlife Protection Act is dated from 1950. That that was the car that rolled off the production line in Australia in 1950. That was the state of technology in 1950. Can you imagine giving that to our police force, taking away the internet, taking away their mobile phones, taking away any technology and saying, right, you go and catch today's criminals using that. that so that's what we've got uh, here at the moment and that's why we need to upgrade it. But let me have a little bit more fun with this. Uh, that's a computer from 1950. I've got about 10,000 times the amount of processing power in my pocket. So things have advanced a little bit since 1950. Uh, and that's a piece of mining equipment from 1950. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine that can lift about, a, about a half a tonne of material uh, and, and move it around. Uh, but now, that's what we've got, right? Let's put that in. Let's let's bring the other guy in there to see how how big he is. That, that's how big he is in comparison, right? So that's the difference between 1950 and today. You think we need a radically different piece of 
environmental legislation to protect our environment because our ability to impact the environment has been radically increased. We haven't got that. We've got a piece of legislation which is still based on this idea of driving an ambulance to the bottom of the cliff, i.e. list things and try and protect things after they've become endangered. What we need to be doing is building a fence at the top of the cliff to prevent them falling over, to prevent them becoming endangered in the first place. But the new legislation doesn't do that. That's a average sort of sized fishing boat in the Australian fishing fleet in 1950. What have we got now? We've got super trawlers trying to get into Australian waters. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it, but I have put the 1950s fishing boat on that picture. <laughs> It's just behind that super trawler, it's that little white speck. <laughs> Orders of magnitude greater impact on the environment uh, by these types of technologies that we've developed, and yet our legislative protections are not seeming to advance at all, and as Pierre and others have said, they seem to be going backwards in some respects. That's another thing from 1950 that we should be getting rid of. That's the major power station uh, down at uh, Collie. Uh, it's about to have its uh, 60th birthday and we want to give it a big retirement gift and get it out of the electric system, out of the electricity grid because we don't need it anymore. We've actually got a surplus of electricity in this state because of everyone installing solar panels. But it's still there, a bit like our Wildlife Act. How does that compare to the type of impact that we're having from industry now? Well, that's, that's the Barrow Island uh, uh, gas processing hub that Chevron have built on an A-class nature reserve. An A-class nature reserve has been completely despoiled like that and that's allowed. That's, that's permissible under our biodiversity protection legislation. So again, our, our ability to impact on the environment is dramatically changed and yet we still have this uh, anachronistic legislation. So it's no surprise that uh, we have less than a thousand individuals left of our state faunal emblem. You would think the species that should get the highest level of protection, the state faunal emblem, and yet, you know, we can log its habitat. Now, that brings us to the point, what is protected and what does protection mean? Well, I can't go and kill that number with a trap or a gun, uh, but if I work for the, the logging industry, I can destroy its habitat with a bulldozer. And this is reflecting a type of thinking in 1950 when the wildlife legislation was drafted. Ecology wasn't even taught in universities then. It was before ecology was even a recognised discipline and people didn't realise and recognise the interconnection of the fact that that number uh, needs the habitat that it relies on to survive. If you take away the habitat, you take away the number. And so we've still got that same situation perpetuated to this day in 2016 in the new legislation because these same industries would be exempt uh, from the protection that it would offer. Uh, so ecology is obviously now teaching us all sorts of things about the protection of our wildlife. And, you know, what we had was first generation environmental protection laws. Uh, what's proposed now by the government is probably first generation with a few tweaks around the edges. We actually need second or third generation environmental laws, as I say, that get ahead of the game and put that fence at the, at the top of the cliff rather than rushing with an ambulance to the bottom. And by the way, it's a 1950s ambulance. Uh, we talked about the global biodiversity hotspots, so I don't need to talk about that other than just to reiterate that it, the reason why it's a biodiversity hotspot is not just because we've got incredibly high biodiversity, but the vulnerability of it and the fact that it's under threat. And you would think that a biodiversity bill would require some sort of monitoring of the environment so that the government can keep track of how much biodiversity we've got and whether we're protecting it or not. Well, it doesn't. And the last time we had any form of attempt to assess the state of our environment was way back in 2007. And the 2007 State of the Environment Report, by the way, the state government have done away with State of the Environment Reporting. They've defunded that part of the Environmental Protection Authority. They've defunded all of the data collection that occurred in all sorts of other agencies to provide input into the State of the Environment Reporting, so we no longer have that. 
Uh, but in that 2007 State of the Environment report, it listed habitat loss as the key threatening process for our biodiversity. But since then, in terms of policies, we've gone backwards. Since then, land clearing laws have been weakened. Uh, and Janita and the Wilderness Society have done some work on this. I think they've found that land clearing has actually been increasing in the last uh, recent times. Uh, forest logging, uh, Jess talked about that, has been allowed to increase for a whole decade under a new forest management plan, which is signed off by the Environment Minister and approved by the Environmental Protection Authority with zero conditions placed on that management plan. Zero enforceable conditions. Uh, and we've had other things like prescribed burning increasing in terms of their budget and their impact. There's a couple of other things that have disappeared off the bottom of that list. But you get the picture. We're not, we're not doing better, we're doing worse. And now the government's introduced this new biodiversity legislation, which doesn't protect biodiversity, but allows the minister to sign off on extinction for it. So um, we've got this process that they're calling the Perth uh, Peel Green Growth Plan. It's been called a Green Growth Scam, and I just want to tell you a little bit about why we might consider that to be a scam. Uh, this is the recovery, so the Perth Peel Green Growth Plan was an attempt to assess the impact that future land use in the Perth Peel region, for mostly for urban development, but also for other purposes, uh, would have on, on, on the biodiversity in that area. And remember, we're in a biodiversity hotspot, so there's a lot of uh, uh, species that need to be protected there. Uh, one of them is the Carnaby's cockatoos, which is protected, or so-called protected, under federal and state legislation. And this is the instrument that is supposed to protect it. So this is the recovery plan. It's got the nice logos there. You can see that it's endorsed by the state government and the Commonwealth government. OK, so let's compare the green growth plan, what that would do, uh, to these objectives, which is supposed to be the statutory recovery plan. <coughs> and by the way, the only reason why we know that this would be the impact of the green growth plan was because the government commissioned a population viability analysis, looking at the black cockatoos and the impact it would have, and then hit the results, and they were leaked. They were leaked to the Conservation Council and we released them to the media. So the only reason why we even know this stuff uh, is because uh, the, the government's commissioned research and then tried to hide it and it's been leaked. Uh, it would result in a 50% reduction in habitat for the northern population of Carnaby's cockatoos. There's two major populations, the northern population, uh, and both are in decline anyway. There's a background decline, see very significant background decline. This, would, this green growth plan would accelerate that decline. Uh, it would result in 50% reduction in habitat for the northern uh, um, population. The removal of the largest roost site, there was uh, a mega roost, uh, was identified just this last uh, season with the uh, great coffee count. Uh, and the largest food resource, which is actually the Nangara pine plantation. That would be removed under the green growth plan. Uh, that would result, I mean, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? You take away half of the food and half of the habitat, you're going to take away half of the birds. And that's exactly what the government's population viability assessment said that it would do. It would halve the population of birds in that, normal, in that northern population. And we've only just found out, or tweaked on to the fact, that this green growth plan isn't even going to have a formal environmental impact assessment. It's not even going to have a set of ministerial conditions that are enforceable under the state environment legislation because it, it won't be assessed, it will just be subject to informal advice by the EPA. Uh, that's what they're proposing for this green growth plan which would then lock in the development pattern for the next 30 years. This is, this is significant stuff here. Um, so with no formal environmental impact assessment, no enforceable conditions. Uh, now, the state government thinks that the federal minister can just sign this off. And maybe they can. And if they can, it shows how weak our federal environment laws are as well. So we can't rely on those either. This the, the Carnaby's Cockatoo is listed, as I said, under the federal legislation and the state legislation. But if we see a scenario where the federal minister can just sign off on 50% reduction in a species, then that just shows us how appalling 
the, uh, the Commonwealth legislation is. And by the way, uh, I'm the Vice President of the Australian Conservation Foundation as well as my role with the Conservation Council here. <coughs> ACF is taking Minister Hunt to court right now uh, to overturn the approval for the Carmichael coal mine. Now, not only is the Carmichael coal mine a disaster for the Great Barrier Reef and for global greenhouse emissions, but it wipes out half of the habitat for a particular finch, uh, which is endangered there, and the, the minister has reports on his desk which say if you wipe out half of that habitat, which the mine will do, that finch will become extinct. He's still approved that mine. He's approved it twice now because the first approval was overturned in the court. So that shows you how weak the federal laws are as well. So it's not just a state matter, it's also a, a commonwealth matter. Um, that's the end of my <coughs> slide, but I just wanted to show you this because and the reason why I just mentioned this stuff about the federal uh, minister and the federal uh, legislation is because we're in a federal election campaign. So I wouldn't normally mention this, but ABC Vote Compass, uh, interestingly, shows that the environment is actually polling in the top three issues here in Western Australia for the federal election. So, thanks to all of those people who've gone and filled in that ABC Vote Compass, because somehow you've got environment above health uh, and above education, the two issues that normally dominate these sorts of polls. So we've got a huge opportunity to put the environment on the agenda properly for the election. And this is one of the ways that we can do that. This is a voter <coughs> pledge. And 30,000 people across the country have already signed these voter pledges. This is a, this is a pledge that a voter, or you, you, whoever signs this pledge, will use their vote to support clean energy, cut pollution, and most importantly, protect our reefs, rivers, forests and wildlife with new and updated uh, protection legislation. So, what's going to happen with these things, and you can get them out there uh, when you leave, uh, don't take them away, fill it in and leave it here, and then they will get sent to your local candidate. So your local candidates will know uh, that you have made this voter pledge, and we'll be asking them to take a candidate's pledge, and take a candidate's pledge to protect uh, these things. And if they refuse to take that candidate's pledge, then that will be publicly uh, available information as well. So we'll be reporting back to all those people that take uh, voter pledges to say, here's how your candidates stack up. Here's the ones that signed on to the candidate's pledge, and here's the ones that haven't. So that's a really good thing we can do at the national level. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, hand back to Janita because it's really critical that we keep the focus at the same time at the state level uh, because, let's face it, under the Australian Constitution, states do have the, uh, the responsibility for protecting the environment. And so Janita is going to tell us about what we can do at the state level uh, to make sure we get better wildlife protection laws here as well. So thanks very much.